taking their seats. I'd really appreciate it. So would the fire marshal. Hi. How are you? Nice to see you again. Okay, Thank you? you for coming. Thank nice you. Nice to see you. I love that shirt. I need one just like it. <laughs> it's green. All righty. We'll just wait for everyone to uh, get seated and we can get started here. Okay. <laughs> Great, hi everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Really appreciate you coming out. We're so excited to have you here this evening. We have a couple members of the uh, Parks, Recreation, Open Space, and Libraries Board here this evening. Tanya, where are you? Tanya? Oh, there you are. Thank you for being here. And uh, Davis, Galetta, back there, thank you for being here. We really appreciate your service on that board. We really, really appreciate it. Um, there's a lot of Parks, Recreation, and Libraries staff that have helped to make this evening possible. Is it off again? No, it's good. Okay, I'm told it's good. Can you hear me back there? Everything okay? Yes? All right, I'm seeing some thumbs up. No? It's hard to hear me. All right, are we good there? Yes? All right, I'm getting some thumbs up now. All right, um, I would also like to uh, thank the city manager, Mark Freitag, for being here this evening. Mark, thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. So, all righty. So uh, really glad to have everyone out here to uh, talk about Westminster Hills open space. It's just great to have so much interest and passion around our open space here in Westminster. Uh, we're here really to figure out how to take care of this amazing natural area. Um, we want it to be around for everyone to enjoy today and long into the future. Westminster is really celebrated for its open space. It uh, defines our visual character. It really defines our quality of life in a lot of ways. I'm so proud to say that we have preserved 15% of the city's land mass, 15% as permanently protected open space, natural areas. Uh, you know, Westminster Hills is our largest open space. It's 1,000 acres, but it is at risk. And uh, really, we have to figure this out together. How are we going to really enjoy this open space sustainably? So uh, I'm Tomas Herrera Mischler. I'm the Director of Parks, Recreation, and Libraries for the City of Westminster. You know, besides parks, our department also takes care of the city's open spaces, which they're like many wilderness areas. You can visit them for hiking, bird watching, or just soaking up nature. And for a lot of us, it's just right outside our back door. So the purpose of our meeting tonight is we're gonna present, I'm gonna to present to you a summary of the environmental study that was recently completed. What have we learned about the site? Uh, we've got a consultant that did, did some really good baseline uh, studies for us, and they made some preliminary recommendations. We're going to, I'm going to report back to you what we've heard from the community since our open house back in January. And, uh, and then I'm going to describe the process that we as a community are going to go through to get to some kind of resolution on how to best take care of this open space. Uh, I will be uh, putting together a community advisory team, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, there will be plenty of time for questions and comments at the end of my, of my uh, talk and presentation. So if you could hold your comments and questions till then, that would be great. I uh, appreciate that. Let's see. It's not advancing. This is always annoying. Oh, you have to turn it on. Yeah, don't you hate that? No, I did. It was on. I turned it off. Okay, here we go. All right, so we're so lucky to have these 3,800 acres of protected natural lands uh, all across uh, Westminster. 
And really, Westminster Hills, our largest open space, 1,000 acres. I wanted to just point out that, um, oh, dag nabbit, sorry. All right, if it's automatically advancing, I'm going to be ticked. Um, so Indiana Street, over on the west, far side of the screen. Sim Street over here on the east, and then 100th Avenue along the southern edge-ish, OK? So that's Stanley. And then you can see a little bit of Stanley Lake Regional Park down here in the corner. <clears throat> so the site is divided into two big parcels. The west side is the off-leash dog area, 400 acres. And then the east side, down that middle line there, that whole west side is 600 acres of dog on leash area. So that's what we got there. I think it's important to understand the difference between parks and open space. Um, parks are really defined in our city code as uh, areas that are designed for really active use. So it might have a rec center in it or a ball field or, you know, it's playgrounds, that kind of, of space. They're intended for active use. By contrast, open spaces are really intended for passive recreational use. So that includes hiking or nature studies or nature photography, that kind of thing. So what's an open space? Uh, they're more like nature preserves, right? It's where we want to keep things as natural as possible for native plants, for native animals, and for everyone who enjoys them. So this includes the preservation and protection of natural areas, water bodies, amazing vistas, uh, native flora, native fauna. City code does allow for some active uses in uh, open space. But it requires the city manager to determine that the active use is not negatively impacting on that natural area. So, so let's just. The other thing that's probably worth mentioning is that Westminster Hills open space is not a dog park. It's not officially a dog park. It's an off-leash area in an open space. That's, that's a difference there. <laughs> Believe it or not. So I've been asked many times, why do we have such a big off-leash dog area in Westminster Hills? I'll give you a quick summary of how we came to have such a large off-leash dog area in one of our open spaces. So way back in 2000, I'll get around to 23 in a minute here, but way back in, the two, in 2000, Parks and Rec went to city council and got permission to do a small pilot off-leash dog area. Now, if you think back to 2002, off-leash dog areas were almost unheard of. They were really not a, a normal common thing in a lot of cities. So. It was wildly popular. And in 2008, Parks and Rec expanded it to the whole 1,000 acres. One year later, they said, uh-oh, and they re we reduced it to four, the 400 acres that we have today. And one of the reasons that happened is that the east side of the open space is very, very sensitive ecologically. And I'll tell you a little bit about that later. So we know that Westminster Hills open space is really special because it's got those amazing views of the Rockies right there at the foothills. It's got some beautiful flora, fauna, uh, and it's really a rare remnant of what used to be the most common prairie type in the, foot, in the front range, which was the short grass prairie. It's now the most endangered uh, prairie type in our state. It's the most endangered ecosystem in our state. So it's very special from the ecological perspective. It's gotten super popular, with, especially with dog owners. And uh, this is such a great spot for people and their puppies. There, there's no place like it. I've seen so many happy dogs when I go out there. They're just thrilled to be there. And their parents too, right? But it is putting quite a strain on the natural environment out there. With so many dogs and people visiting, there's really not enough parking, more wear and tear on the landscape, the invasive plants are taking over, and we have a poop problem. Yes, I did use that word. Oh, shoot, I'm supposed to talk about this. So 
I was talking a little bit about uh, the, the environmental study that we commissioned. And so they started their work in March, um, really doc documenting the conditions out on the site. They did an uh, online survey, they did an on-site survey, and they also uh, paid attention to and monitored visitor use out there. And uh, they continued their assessments until uh, completing them in November, came up with some recommendations which I'll get into in a minute. And uh, then going forward, uh, we're in February getting public feedback. <laughs> Yay, look at all the people in this room, it's amazing. Um, and then we're going to uh, formulate a, uh, this community advisory team, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then we're going to have them really look at all of the community's input and options and help us come up with a recommendation for city council. So get their best thinking on that. Let's see if I missed anything. So the ERO is the name of the consulting firm that we hired. And uh, they, they basically pointed their uh, Captain Obvious, this many people on this site is causing some strain, right? Uh, the current condition on the site were presented to our uh, advisory board and uh, then we also presented some preliminary recommendations. We had uh, Joseph Raleigh, who's our superintendent of open space. Do you remember our November meeting when we presented all this information? Where as many people as We had 12 people <laughs> come to that meeting. So this is fantastic. We're really, really glad to have you here this evening. So we can share this information with so many people in our community that care. Obviously, there's more parking demand than there are parking spaces. It's putting wildlife at risk. We've got an erosion problem out there. Invasive plants are taking over. Un undesignated paths, sometimes called social paths, have exploded all over the site. And we have a dog waste issue. So really, uh, Eros was tasked with documenting the baseline conditions out there, and uh, they really found that the land is stressed out. We've got cars parking all over the place. We've got topsoil blowing off. Um, it, it was so bad uh, a few years ago that we had to get snow plows out there to plow the soil off of Sims Street. That's pretty bad. Um, and then. We've created perfect growing conditions for a plant called tumbleweed. And tumbleweed loves over-fertilized soil, and it loves disturbed soil. So the, it's, we've got an explosion of tumbleweeds. Anyone here live in uh, countryside? Anyone ever seen tumbleweeds blowing into your neighborhood? Yeah, it's crazy. I, I saw it the first time. I couldn't believe it because it was up to, uh, up to the eaves there. So. And then, uh, unfortunately, the, the dog waste that's left on the ground has caused a real contamination problem in all of the water bodies out on the site. I'm, it, unfortunately, we have e, uh, e. coli levels in the water bodies that exceed EPA's safety standards to the point where we're going to have to limit access for puppies and people to keep them out of the water because it's too dangerous. It'll spread disease to them and to people. So un that's one of the unfortunate consequences that we have to deal with. Uh, I get to talk about poop. So um, we, part of the ERO study is they looked at uh, several different plots around the site and they literally counted how many piles of dog poop there was and in one 200 square foot area, they found 100 piles of poop. That's a lot of poop. So, and that's the poop that's not collected. The, the amount that's collected every year is about 350,000 pounds of poop. Uh, we fill up nine of the, you can't really see it very well, but there's a huge bag, it's about 1,000 pounds, that gets pulled out of those underground chambers. We have nine of those, 250 gallons all over the site, and uh, they get filled up. We have to empty them every two weeks or so in the summertime. That's enough poop to almost fill the swimming pool here at City Park Rec. 
And that's the stuff that gets collected and put into the trash, the waste receptacles. It's not even counting what's left behind on the ground. So it's an issue. You might say it's a stinky mess. Um, the other issue that we're looking at, this is back in 2005 before really the dog, off-leash dog walking got started. And here's, a, here's Sims, and here's a hundredth right here. Sims and a hundredth. So it's the 400 acres that we're talking about. And uh, you can see in 2015, this and this, that's the difference in the number of paths that have grown. A lot of these paths are about 10, 10 miles of the paths are official, and uh, like sort of designated trails. Uh, can you hold your question? This 2005. Is that right, Joe? 2005 for the original? The base is 2005. The one that just got flashed up is 2015. 2015. Yeah. And then this is 2018. Before. Before. Can we, let's just keep plowing ahead because we got to cover a lot of territory tonight. And there'll be lots of time afterwards for comments and questions for sure. But anyway, you can see in 2023, with both parking lots in place, uh, the official trails have gotten considerably wider and the number of unofficial trails has just really exploded across the site. Um, I want to take a moment just to address the new concrete trail that was installed recently on the southern side of, the, of it. So um, for, for quite some time now, that stretch of 100th Avenue has been designated as the most dangerous bicycling condition in the city. Sadly, we had a, a cyclist killed uh, some years back. And uh, so we were, uh, we were able to get a grant the city got a grant to remedy that situation and uh, to install that one mile pathway. It is intended eventually to turn and go down Alkire and continue, but uh, that's what we could get for the amount of the grant that we got. So that's why it was installed to, and it's now gone from most dangerous to most safe cycling spot in the city. So that's a good thing. Nobody Not yet. Yeah, she said nobody uses it and she's right. The other thing I just want to talk to, I'll uh, mention. <laughs> city hasn't taken ownership. I'm just always going to give you it straight. I mean, that's how I am. Sorry. But it's really important that that exists because so that when we get more money, we can continue that path down al and create a really safe condition. So um, now I forgot what I was going to say because I got distracted there. Anyway, move on. Oh, uh, just the volunteer trails. Again, there's uh, 12 miles of volunteer trails, the unofficial trails, 10 miles of official trails. So there's been a, there's a phenomena that we've seen out there, and it's pretty common, is that those trails continue to get wider and wider and wider. And it's a reflection of the amount of use that this place is getting. So that if you see the, the little, ay, caramba, sorry. I have done this before. OK. I'm not going to even try. So you see these two white arrows? That's 10 feet wide. That's a normal trail, good sized trail in all of our open spaces. That's a standard. So the trail over time has grown with another 25 feet or so on each side. And then, can you see the, the change in the color of vegetation on each side? It's about another 30 feet or so of what we call disturbed conditions. Uh, again, creating perfect growing conditions for tumbleweed in there. And that's mostly what you see growing in there is tumbleweeds. So it's... Uh, it's not as, uh, as, not as bad with the smaller trails, but on the sort of wider official trails, especially the closer you get to the parking lots, the more disturbance there is. Uh, yeah, parking, everybody knows it's an issue. Again, those of you that live in countryside, you've seen it. Um, in the last year, uh, parking enforcement has issued almost 400 tickets out there 
So they're very rigorous in trying to keep folks from parking illegally along Sims. It's a, I don't know. Uh, he asked how many were thrown out. I don't know what you mean by that, but oh, I don't know. Um, I do not know the answer to that, but I could probably find out. Um, he asked how many of those tickets were thrown out, and I don't know the answer to that. No, no, no. They're well signed. They're well posted. Don't park here. It's it's a no parking zone. It's yeah. I'm, no, I'm not. Please. I'm just trying to get through all this information so that then everybody who wants to comment and ask questions has time to do it. So let's keep plowing ahead. The, this is a lot of parking demand and not enough parking. So 141 spaces out there. We've, we've increased parking out there six times in the last decade or so, and it just grows the demand. So. You're right, on most weekdays, I think there's enough parking. It's on the busy weekends where it really gets crazy. And we see a lot of this kind of parking along Sims and then invading into uh, countryside. Okay, so. So we get to the recommendations from the consultants. So these are the experts telling us what they think. And uh, they really said, move to less off-leash dog park out there. Uh, on the, we've really come to understand that as you move from east to west, the site becomes more sensitive, more ecologically sensitive. And so their recommendation is on the far east, northeast corner, make an off-leash area, a, dog, a, dog, a formal dog park with amenities and water and all those things that are not really what we have out there today. So that's their recommendation. Then the rest of the 400 acres is on leash. So it still welcomes dogs, but on leash. I know, you can shake your heads, it's okay. Well, I'm just saying this is the recommendation that we got. So great question, we'll get to that for sure at the end, but it's about a lot less than the people on the east side. Right. And then um, as you get to the far, the 600 acres to the west, they recommended no dogs at all because it's so sensitive. It's the only spot in the whole city where we have a active uh, nesting burrowing owl pet pair. Only, the only place in the whole city. So uh, that's where you know, we get to the dogs are welcome, but on a leash part of this talk. And then the west side, super delicate, super sensitive, no dogs at all. That's what their recommendation was. So just this is how it looks like on a, on a map. 33 acres, that's what 33 acres looks like. It's one mile. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take questions. Survey so I hate to interrupt you, but I interrupted him, so I'm going to interrupt you. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get there. I'm definitely going to get there. She's asking about what about the recommendations we got online from the community. I'm definitely getting there. No, in the plan. Yeah, there, yeah we got a thousand responses. Thousand. Yeah, lots and lots of input. So, and I'm going to get to that. Yeah. Well, I, I've, if I may, please, can I have your attention, please? I don't want to sick the city manager on you. So I'm just kidding, please. All right, so here's what we heard from the community after our last community open house where we had a bunch of people come. We got a thousand comments. And it breaks down into kind of four not unexpected categories. 
47% of, of the comments we got said, leave it as it is, right? Yeah. A lot of people, yeah. almost half. Yeah. The experts, I'm skipping down one, the experts said, we know the 33 acres, right? We got quite a few people saying, well, how about more than 33, but less than 400? So there was that kind of compromise idea. And then there was uh, quite a few people that said, no dogs at all, get them out of that place. It's not intended for that. So we did get quite a few people, not nearly as many that said, as said, don't do anything at all. Um, but we definitely got some that recommended that. I don't, I don't know the percentage, I'm sorry. It is so, Can we wait until the end? I know there's, everybody wants to talk. It's wonderful. I love how much passion there is in the room. But let's get through this, and then there'll be a lot of time for questions and comments, OK? Um, we had some other recommendations, great recommendations, uh, adding additional parking, um, looking at a fee-based um, structure like in uh, Boulder, for example, or at Cherry Creek. Um, just convert the open space to, uh, yeah, in Chatford. Um, just convert it to parkland and be done with it. That was one recommendation. And the other is I had a ton of people say, I want to help. I want to be out there. I want to be part of it. And so recruiting volunteers. And I'm definitely up for that. <laughs> I'm all for recruiting volunteers for sure. So OK, so next steps. Where do we go from here? There's a survey that opened today. It's on the website. I'll show you the QR code in a minute. We want you to tell us about your thoughts about those four options. Okay, there, it's uh, going to be open for two weeks, so there'll be time for people who aren't here, who are listening online, or who want to who watch it later on YouTube or Facebook. Um, so there's also an application form online available right now for the uh, community advisory team. So if you're interested in serving on that team, please fill out the application. What I'm looking for is really a wide variety of opinions and background and expertise to populate that um, community advisory team. I'm informed that the mayor will be uh, the city council's representative to that team. And so we're gonna have uh, about four or five meetings over the next couple of months where we really dig into what are the options here? What are the recommendations? What can we do out here to create a more sustainable management plan for this open space? If anyone thinks that there's been a predetermined, uh, a predetermined decision about this, let me disabuse you of that. That is not the case. This is an honest, truly honest effort to gather input from the community to try and figure out what to do with this really tough situation. Uh, we're going to take a recommendation to the city manager. We'll um, have another community meeting, uh, probably around June, mid-June, something like that. And then uh, we'll take it to city council and have them give us their best wisdom on how to go forward. So I'm almost done. OK, almost done. And now I'm done. <laughs> so we have two microphones at either side. And the reason I'm going to ask you to go to the microphones is that's the only way the people online can hear what you have to say. So if you'd be so kind as to uh, line up, and we'll try to, I also, there's a lot of people here. Um, Fire Marshal, did we get our 325 people? So we're at capacity. So I'm going to ask all of you to be considerate and keep your comments and questions brief. And I'll try to keep my answers brief as well. And we also have Joe here as a subject matter specialist who's really very, very in-depth knowledge about the, the whole situation. So why don't we start over here with this gentleman and then we'll go back and forth, okay? Yeah, uh, so your first point with the parking where you said ample parking has been done. Um, that being said, I actually was ticketed there and it's actually pretty predatory the way it's set up. There were two, I was told, hey, well there's a, you know, right on, I think what was that, 100th or 104th, there yeah, and that there's extra parking there, always packed. Right on Sims, always packed. And so people were parking on the dirt. They then put stakes in the ground, okay, hey, don't park there. 
But yet, they didn't put stakes on the other side. They let people continue to park and ticket them so you can continue to make money. It's Asian provocateur. It's allowing people the ability to do the wrong thing, and then you're making money off it, and you're allowing them to do that. So that's the first complaint. The second complaint is looking at these kind of poster boards, wherever they are, there's, there's no action plan. There's no charter. There's no mission to this. There's no milestones. It's just, we're going to make a recommendation, and the city's going to do it. What's that layout look like? There's, there's really no plan set forth here. And you know, just to the other point where it's saying, was it per 100 square feet or something like that? They found dog feces. Well, what was the nature of the other feces? You obviously went and measured dog. What was the nature for coyote and other animals that are out there? That seems to be om omitted from that. And then to her point, there's no data. There's, you had, you, the, the woman behind me asked for data. You dodged a question. And then, you know, I get it's uncomfortable, but there was no data up there. There's no, hey, this percentage of this. So that way, if anyone had questions, it kind of quelled it. It looks dishonest. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Um, if, if I could ask everyone to just tell us your name and where you're from, we'd really appreciate that as well. Go ahead, please. Hi, my name's Diane Whiteman. I live across the street in Legacy Ridge. Um, I have two questions. My first question is, um, how did your experts determine that dogs were the biggest factor contributing to the erosion? Mm -hmm. How did they evaluate bicycles, people, other natural animals, etc.? Because everything that I've heard is dogs need to be on leashes and much smaller space. And I'm not convinced that the dogs and the dog owners are the biggest factor contributing to the issue. I'm all for preserving, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure that dogs are the biggest issue. And my second part of my question, if you know the answer, what percentage of my Westminster real estate taxes yes. Yes. go to sustain that particular space so that I can determine mm -hmm. if my money's being well spent? Okay. Great. I know it's really great to applaud people for what they've said. If we can not do that, it'll make things go a little bit quicker. Um, I know it's really, it would be great if we could do that. Um, I'm going to ask Joe Reale to uh, answer the first question, and I don't know the answer to the second question. I, so the, I can answer the second question first. The, the second question, I, I can't. His, his, uh, <laughs> can, can you hear point. me? <laughs> I apologize. Um, the, there is no real estate tax that goes into the open space fund. The open space, the open space is funded by the post, the parks, open space and trails tax, which is a sales tax, not a real estate tax. What percentage, I, I don't know. So that, that's the easier answer. What percentage of our Westminster sales tax then goes to it? It is one quarter of 1% goes to parks, recreation and open space, the, to everything that we do, not specifically to that area. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first question, though, is about w how how did we determine the impacts of dogs? And there is, as as Tomas indicated, you know, back in 2000 when this went online, they were unique. There weren't a whole lot of places in the Front Range anywhere that had off-leash dog opportunities. Since that time, there are a number of them, and there has been a number of scientific studies that have been done, published literature studies that show, yeah, recreation has impacts, and as you step up the volume of impact, the type of use dramatically matters. And one of the kind of tipping points is dogs off leash actually have a disproportionate effect both on wildlife and on trail condition. It's the nature of how we use the space. So we have a, a Two, two variables working here. We have a whole lot of people, and the way they're using the space is contributing to our problems. That's how we get to the recommendations. That's how we make our, our decisions. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate that. Um, sir? Hi, my name is Dan Fox. Um, I'm a countryside resident, which is right across the street from the Sims um, entrance. Um, and I will be voting on this issue. Um, so I have a couple of points. So the first one is is um, the, the initiation of this particular um, effort seems a little bit ambiguous to me. It feels like 
you guys are just tr you, you noted that there's degradation and then you're trying to claim that some pact back in the day where it was created is now being violated and it feels like there's not a lot of numbers on that one. Um, this, my second point is that uh, another option for what you had up there is that um, I, I didn't see anything about greater management. It, it feels kind of like you guys have left an open, you gave us an open space, you call it an open space, and there's no real rules to stop all of this stuff. And then now all of a sudden you're coming to us and saying, hey, you, re you, you didn't read our minds. You, 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 the, the trails are getting larger. You didn't tell us that we shouldn't be making the trails larger. Um, you, we didn't know that we should be avoiding certain aspects. And that's all kind of on the government side of things to ma actively manage it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of things can go a long ways for actively managing things like, hey, you're, you're willing to put a concrete path. If, pe if there were concrete paths in there, I'm sure people would probably go on concrete paths and not wander off into an ever-increasing zone of trailblazing that you pointed out earlier. Um, and, and I'd be very remiss to point out, uh, or not point out, um, my fellow neighbors and myself um, that y you're gonna be pushing a lot, all the people that use the dog park currently into, um, if you do the 33 acre plan, <coughs> it sounds like you're trying to get to. Uh, but if that is indeed the plan, it sounds like you're pushing all the dog owners into there, which is also going to increase the parking there, which is going to shove a lot of people into our neighborhood. Um, and and uh, if you ask my neighbor, she makes a great impression of what it sounds like on a Saturday. I'm not going to repeat it, but it's very noisy. Um, uh, and and I, I live in the back of the neighborhood, never mind the front of the neighborhood. So, um, you know, we, there, there's other aspects to consider other than just the parking lot, but also the neighborhood around it. Um, and, and also being able to not read your minds. You guys got to tell us what we need to do better. Yeah, I think those are really great points. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Deborah. I live in Westminster and I represent the newly formed volunteer group called Westy Dog Park Guardians. How many people are here because of the Guardians? We have two requests. First, we're asking you to decelerate this process of implementing the off-leash reduction recommendation and severely restricting the 420 acres. This has existed since 2000 for dog owners and their dogs uh, at its current size tents since 2009. We're also asking you to consider a collaboration with us. We care about this space. We want to work with you. Uh, we have a lot of good ideas and you claim negative impact. I don't think that you have proved the dogs are responsible for all the negative impact. So we would very much appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with you on solutions. We certainly welcome that, both of those. There are two so. members of our group here um, that are also going to speak. Great, good, thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Laura Konopkin, and I live just down the street from Westminster Hills. Uh, first thing I wanted to mention is that if you haven't had a chance to read the ERO report, definitely recommend it. Um, one thing I thought that was interesting was that the high levels of E. coli, the highest levels, are actually found in the Mower Reservoir, which is on that protected west side, um, where dogs are supposed to be on leash. And the report also says that um, the E. coli in the church ditch water, that could be contributed from agriculture and grazing um, that it runs through before it even gets to the dog park. Um, so the E. coli concern seems to be a little bit contested if it's actually from the dogs. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is that this report, it contains about 40 different recommendations and only one of them says consider reducing impact by reducing the off-leash dog area. So I'm just not sure where the 33 acres came from because that's not in this report. Um, and why don't we consider these other 39 recommendations first before jumping to this extreme act of um, impacting this resource that a lot of us really appreciate. Yes. 
Hi, my name is Andrew Guthrie. I've uh, been a countryside resident since 06, Westminster, both sides of the border since about 98. Uh, I also work with the uh, volunteer group, Westy Dog Park Guardians. You can check out our site, westydogs.org. We're gonna keep everyone updated on the information. Just wanted to share some preliminary ideas that our small but forceful group has already come up with, uh, including large clear signage about park rules and fines associated with non-compliance. Enforcing existing laws, parking, poo pickup, unleash dogs uh, outside of the park, uh, number of dogs per person, etc. Increase patrols, especially on weekends. Add poo bag dispensers and trash cans to encourage visitors to keep the park clean. And that's not just at the entrance and exit. Let's put some on the back side of the park as well. Uh, because if you see where all the poo is left, uh, let, let's spread that out. Reinstate and partner with the community for volunteer cleanup days. I mean, we were just out there last week and, and we had tons of volunteers that could not come, could not join because of city rules. Uh, so we want to be able to have that out there. Uh, consider park passes. We've already talked about that. Consider fundraising ideas. Uh, memory bricks. I mean, we've all had dogs who have loved that place and passed away. Mm -hmm. Let's honor them. Let's get together as a community to help fund the, this absolute wonderful place. Consider implementing mud closure days. We've talked about Boulder. Mm -hmm. You know, let, let's follow some of their rules out there. Uh, schedule a rotation of seasonal closures for parcels uh, for re, re -veg vegetation. We're definitely open to that. Talk about the widening trails. Let, let's get volunteers out there to put in trail guards to help mm -hmm. monitor those trails. Let's not create a problem where there isn't one. Uh, additional bridges over the ditch to help spread out traffic. Uh, Revisit the wire fencing. Uh, there are some very disturbing videos out there of wildlife and dogs getting caught in, in that fencing. And a, as it's been mentioned, let's consider a peer review of that environmental report. We've already had a couple of experts that we've commissioned to review it who have had some strong recommendations. So let's go ahead and get all that information out there and have a clear and open discussion. Thank Great. you. Um, Thank you, really appreciate those recommendations. Please. Hi, uh, my name is Ronnie, I'm off of Oak Circle. Um, I have a couple of questions, some of which coincide with some of the recommendations. Uh, one is with regard to uh, the erosion that you speak of, which is probably contributing to the widening of the trails when it gets incredibly muddy. Um, how much of that is due to people walking through because they don't want to get muddy, and how much is due to drought and climate change? I mean, tumbleweeds blowing and, and dry topsoil getting blown away is very common in drought conditions. So I would, like, I, I would really like an answer to that one if you have it. I, I don't have a specific answer, but I think Joe can probably well, so address what, it. What I'll say is, you're, you're absolutely correct. There's no question that drought and climate change have a compounding factor. What we're saying here is our use then compounds what goes on because of climate change. We talk, we talk a little, yeah, we've lost resiliency, that's, that's a good term. We talked, we've talked a little bit about feces and waste. The actual bigger input out there is urine. Nobody talks about it. There, there's a whole line of research that goes on there. You're dumping massive amounts of nitrogen into the soil. That kills native plants. Anybody that's got a dog, I have two, knows what their lawn looks like after the winter when you haven't been able to water it. It's dead. The first thing that comes back, because the, those things have the adapted characteristics, are our non-natives, the kochia, et cetera. They can exploit that damaged soil that nitrogen rich soil, and we're just, we compound it. Our other problem is, our, 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 oh, I was just about to go there, our only management options for controlling kochia are to spray herbicide. Kochia is tumbleweed, by the way. And, and all of our invasives. The, the better solution is to do both that spray and kill it, and be able to plant and recover. But we p can't plant and recover if we keep having the same impact to the system. So we're in a vicious cycle. And the more that we're in this cycle, the more of that land we use. You're absolutely correct. There's more than one variable involved in this problem. All right. Thank you. I appreciate you. your answer. Uh, the second question I have is with regard to splitting into no dogs at all or 
on leash only versus the off leash how are you going to are you going to build a wall to keep the illegal illegal immigrants out um are you going to put up a fence are you not going to do that and if so how in the world are you going to enforce that and i i uh want to give a shout out and a, and i agree to more uh patrolling on heavy days uh, because i got to tell you the weekenders that come in they don't care if they leave their dog waste yeah. and if they make a mess and if they walk off trail. Thank you so much. Really, I think that uh, you've got a great question about sort of enforcement. And uh, there is a need for more rain park rangers for sure to, to help with enforcement. The other thing is that there, I forget who it was that was mentioning better signage. There is a need for us to communicate better with the community about what is allowed, what isn't allowed, where should people go, where shouldn't they go, you're absolutely right. But then you've got, you don't have an open space, you've got a bunch of billboards, uh, effectively. Yeah, you know, that's another issue that, we'll have another meeting soon to talk about signage, but signage pollution is a real issue, and I've seen some pretty bad examples around our system, so, yes. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dan Allen, Westminster resident, also a member of the Westie Dog Park Guardians. Um, and first thing I wanted to bring up was a couple concerns we had um, after some peer review of the ERO conditions report. First one that's already been mentioned is the E. coli levels in the dog park area compared to the Moa Reservoir are extremely similar, if not virtually identical, which basically proves that if dogs are definitely not exclusively or even largely to blame for that, as the lady already mentioned. Um, second piece is the existence of the social trails, vegetation trampling, plant degradation. Um, it's exacerbated by users, not just dog owners. Um, bikers are gonna damage those trails and I've seen bikers on those unapproved trails all the time. So it's not just a dog owner problem. Um, I think that was kind of skipped in a lot of the presentation. Um, and the existence of the concrete bike trail and the Rocky Mountain Greenway bike trail constructed directly through the open space um, seems through, through what we've, we're calling a sensitive wildlife area, as you put so eloquently, that seems to run counter to your position that we're trying to conserve it by reducing the off-leash dog area by building these trails through it. So, and I'll, I'll finish up right after that. Okay, sure, I, I do, I, I do want to acknowledge the E. coli statement. You're 100% correct. Nowhere in the report and nowhere have we said the e. e. coli is a dog issue. The e. e. coli is a mass I issue. I did say it, actually. Why are you bringing it up? What we are... No, you're right. You're right. No, I definitely said that. What, well, the, what we are saying about E. coli, we have a E. coli problem on the property. It doesn't matter the source. What we are saying is the water is unsafe Per EPA standards, we cannot allow access to it. The Mauer Reservoir EPA issues are likely a waterfall issue. That, that, that's a question. We're not trying to ban dogs because of the E. coli. Actually, we're not. We're not talking. If I could just address I, that for a second, please. So anyone that thinks that there's already a decision that's been made should ask Councillor Azadi if that's true. Should ask the mayor if that's true. Should ask the city manager if that's true. They'll tell you that a decision has not been made. What we're doing is we're trying to gather information from experts, subject matter specialists, the community. We're going to form this community, this uh, community advisory team to help us figure this out. We're going to bring it back to our advisory board, Parks, Recreation, Open Space, and Libraries Advisory Board. We're going to bring their conclusions to City Council. And then they're going to do their best thinking about this. That's why you elected them. That's how this is all going to go down. OK? Uh, you are. That's why you're here tonight, to keep an eye on this, to make sure that. Pardon me? Uh, well, we still have the, we have the data, right? We're sharing the data with you. It's been available online. It's available today. It will be, continue to be available for all of you to see it. Every single one of those comments with a few uh, not nice words blacked out are available on our website for you to see, every single one of them. So 
Uh, did you have another comment you wanted to finish? Oh, I just wanted to close with um, a statement from our whole group. But dog owners are a population that enjoy and utilize the, this exercise and recreation space where we can exercise with our dogs, not on a leash. We can hike with them. Many of us are responsible dog owners. I'd say most of us are responsible dog owners and good citizens. As with any of the parks, recreation spaces, et cetera, there are always going to be responsible citizens who, who diligently protect that and respect that area. And there's gonna be less responsible citizens who fail to manage their impact. The Westy Dog Park Guardians are seeking to increase our stewardship of Westminster Hills through a collaboration with the city of Westminster that includes education, cleanup, and connection that makes a positive impact on our community together. Sounds great, thank you. Boy, you all kicked over a hornet's nest with this one, huh? Yep. We knew it, too. So, my name's <laughs> Hans. I live over on uh, Independence. I got a place over there. Uh, my question is, we've, you've kind of brought up that the purpose of this is to save the grass, save the birds, keep it as a natural preserve. My question is, with the plan to reduce the dog park to a substantially smaller size, what is the objective that you're trying to reach? From where we are now, what are you trying to get to in what time frame? And what leads you to believe that this action is actually going to result in that uh, outcome? That's such a great question. And so really when we look at city council or the city code of what is an open space versus what is a park, that's what was guiding us in our thinking is open space is about preserving our natural open areas here in the, in the city of Westminster. <laughs> It's not about active recreation. So yes, we probably made a mistake opening it up to, non, to uh, off-leash use back in 2000. Probably, I know, but hang on. If the goal is to preserve this open space as a natural area, like a little mini wilderness for our community. So we've got competing desires here in our community for what happens in this space, right? That's why we're having this process and this conversation with you, so that we can figure it out together. It's not easy. It's not straightforward. And you know, the, the, just reducing the amount of people and dogs that are utilizing this space, I guess from scientific studies and other uh, work that I've done, looking at carrying capacity, we've exceeded the carrying capacity of the site. Now, there are other ways to increase capacity, Someone mentioned paved trails, keeping people on the trails. All of the things that the Friends Group has suggested are great recommendations, every single one of them. So I think working together, we could probably figure this out. So. Well, those are words, but what do you actually want to see? How wide do you want to see the trails? What reduction in tumbleweeds do you want to see? What increase in bird population do you want to see? And what leads you to believe that this reduction is going to lead to that? So you're assuming that we've already declared that this is not going to be off-leash use ever, ever, right? You're assuming that, right? I'm not dodging the question. I'm just telling you you're assuming that we're, we're going in that direction. Well, and I, as I've told you, with that decision, <laughs> <made. laughs> the whole presentation has been you want to reduce the 400 acres to 370 acres of on leash area. Okay, so yes, that's the rec one of the recommendations that we got from our expert uh, consultants. Absolutely. That's what they said. After they collected all the data, they said reduce it to a, basically a neighborhood dog park and then preserve the rest of it as an open space. But what does that lead to? That's my question. So I guess if you look at the east side, which is much less used. And I believe you mean west side. I, I, I do that all the time, sorry, <laughs> dyslexic. The west side, which is much less used and visited, mm -hmm. is much more intact as an as a ecological site. Okay. And I think that's really what our, what our goal and our, and our mandate is from city code and from city council is to maintain these open spaces in a healthy ecological manner. So your goal is to make the east side look like the west side. Is that a fair statement? I'd say, yeah. I mean, that would be one of the goals if we decide to retain it as an open space. OK. So, OK. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you're up. <laughs> Hi, how are you? My name is Josh Kimes. I live just across of Sims from the open space. Um, I have like 10 points in my head. <laughs> but I know you said keep it brief, so we'll see what we do. Uh, first off, you mentioned whenever you were going through the timeline of the open space from 2000 to where we are today, 
started as eight acres, went up to 1,000 acres, down to 400 and change. Okay. Yeah. The reason you said that deduction occurred was due to the sensitive nature of the wildlife, whereas on your website, it indicates that the reason of the reduction was an outbreak of bubon bubonic plague amongst the native coyote population, as well as multiple interactions with coyotes and dogs. So where's the disconnect in what you're presenting to us and what's on the website? Which information is incorrect? Well, I think probably my comment is not as accurate as what's on the website, but I'm going to let Joe comment on that because he knows for sure. So the, what you're asking is, in 2008, it was expanded to roughly 800, 900 acres. A year later, it's reduced to 400 acres. Due to the coyote and bubonic the, 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 I wasn't here at that time. That's what the website says. What, what, what I, and what is on the website, and the information we have is based on a uh, council agenda packet that stated why we were doing this to council. And the stated reasons to council in 2009 were multiple. One of them was they had multiple impact dog and coyote conflicts. You had a bubonic plague outbreak in the prairie dog colony, not the coyotes. You had a bubonic plague outbreak in the prairie dog colonies, and it was identified as a more sensitive area. So all three of those factors were part of it. Only that two are listed online, though, which is interesting. The, the memo is available. <clears throat> sure. I'm just saying what's listed online on your website, readily available. Um, regarding the overuse by passive use, a lot of people that come to the park that are overusing it are not residents of Westminster. Mm -hmm. um, I firmly believe that if we were to look at this in a truly democratic way and propose a referendum on our next election cycle, whether or not we should keep the open space as the off-leash area or not, uh, we would get an overwhelming majority saying that we would get, we should keep it as the off-leash space because it is so prized amongst the community. A lot of the members who are damaging it are not from the community, and um, I think it could be a very simple solution as to restrict use by fee um, for non-residents while maintaining free use for residents as it is part of our tax system. Um, oh, lost my train of thought there. <laughs> That's a good one, though. <laughs> really good. Um, Regarding the topsoil blowing, mm -hmm. a lot of that comes down to trail widening, um, not necessarily overuse across into the parking lots. It's a 40 foot wide trail leaving the parking lot, so that can't really be attributed to overuse, but more just to the fact that the trail is as wide as it is, and paving would be a good option there. Sorry, I'm trying to regain what I had <laughs> here. Um, if we, oh, sorry. It's okay, take your time. Thanks. Can we jump to the next person while sure. I regain my thought? Thank you. How do we do that? <laughs> Hi, yeah, uh, I'm Dave Sanford. I live behind Sims. Uh, dogs need to run. And uh, I, uh, yeah. and uh, I'm wondering whether your expert consultant has dogs, which is one question. <laughs> But um, I really would like to see uh, some signage that sort of puts in people's heads that they might, upon occasion, pick up poop from dogs that are not their own. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's uh, and uh, and I rarely see tumbleweeds there, and I'm out there uh, a couple hours a day usually. So yeah. that's all I got. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I will just say really quickly one thing, and it's uh, that we're really pleased to let you know that uh, Leave No Trace is coming to town, and they're going to be partnering with the community and with us to um, really share the value and importance of Leaving No Trace when you visit uh, Westminster Hills Open Space. So I'm really excited about having them come to town. So, you remember Sorry, what you were I asked say? the guy behind me, and he said it's okay if I keep talking. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so, my last two points, one, in regard to the urine, you were mentioning nitrogen increases due to urine. Maintaining the 400 acres as an on-leash dog space is not going to reduce the nitrogen in the soil, so that will have no effective impact on the non-native species, um, unless you have some more information to contradict that. Nope. No? Okay. Um, second bit is, in the municipal code, there are already ordinances in regard to 
um, fines. I believe it's $130 fines that are stated to be, quote, strictly enforced for not picking up dog feces. Now, being part of the municipal code, this is something we are agreeing to to live in the, in the city, something that our taxes go towards enforcing. So the question comes down to, why are we being punished for a lack of local enforcement if it is an issue of dog feces? This is a failure to the city to not enforce their codes um, rather than a failure of the citizens. You're, you're yeah. Yeah. Good. Very good, thank you. Yeah, great comments. Sir? Hi there, uh, my name is Dan Koss. Uh, I live in countryside about a couple hundred feet away from the Sims parking lot, so constant cars uh, in front of my property. Um, <clears throat> I was going to ask about enforcement, but that was already asked. Great question, um, yeah. So my second question is, if the goal is to protect the open space, how can we ensure that reducing the size will actually reduce the visitation and the problems or prevent them from overflowing into the neighborhoods and the surrounding area? Yeah, I think that's a really key question that we have to get an answer to. Um, I guess it, part of me assumes that, that if it's no longer 400 acres, it's no longer publicized on every single app out there as the best off-leash area in the world, uh, maybe we'll have quite a few fewer people coming. That's my assum uneducated assumption. So, yeah. Thank you. Sir? My name is Brian. I live across the street from the dog park. Uh, got a couple of points on there. Get a little closer to it. <laughs> there you go. There we go. Oh, oh dang. Perfect. There you All go. All right. <laughs> my name is Brian. I live across the street from the dog park. I narrowed this down from like 15 things. My first question, the area for the fecal sample is within the first 15 meters of the most populated trail in the dog park? Absolutely, yeah. Would you agree that this skewed the study? Yeah. Then why'd you use it? Uh, because it's very powerful. I appreciate the honesty. Like, yeah. we should give him props for being honest, yeah. at least. Yeah. <laughs> uh, your point about undesignated trails is well received, but to whatever extent humans are causing that, is that not better than putting a strain on our already like underemployed medical community? I don't. What? Well, people are either going to be sitting on the couch smoking weed, getting fat, or they're going to go to the dog park <laughs> and they're going to walk. Which is better? Great point. <laughs> Genuine question. Yeah. No if answer. I could just take a second to, if I could take a second to address. Oh man. Sorry about that. Um, so just to address that uh, issue really quick is that when you have desire paths like that, a lot of times that means that your formal paths are in the wrong spot. So part of this process of rethinking our open space and how to best use it is rethinking the whole circulation system because it's kind of crazy spaghetti right now. So I'd, I'm a landscape architect by training and I look at that spaghetti of paths and think, wow, we could do better than that. And so that's part of the goal as we rethink how to use this site and how to better set it up for success. So, go ahead. All right, I've got two more things. Both of them are just statements. Your trail condition slide is manipulated to try and make your point stronger. These pictures were not taken in the same season and anyone who's been a regular at the dog park is well aware of that. It's not two different locations. It's the tree let, to the east of the bridge. To that, no, to there, that. There's one. I, I, the pictures that were in my presentation, the original presentation, are one from the north lot, one from the south lot. Both taken on the same day. Copy. All right, my last point, and it's not an argument of one. I just want to say that this open space is a pride and joy of Westminster. It's not downtown Westminster. That was a flop. Um, <laughs> That. Whether it's athletes going for a workout, people walking their dogs, or just someone chilling and relaxing, unwinding after work, this is what makes Westminster Westminster, not just for us, but for people from like 45 minutes away. Agreed. So, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Great. You guys should really like, no one here supports this. <laughs> this shouldn't even really be a meeting. My name's Diana Wilson, I live in Westbrook, and I just, since we're discussing environmental impacts, I just wanted to throw out there that my big concern is 
I always understood that open space was reserved because it's adjacent to the old Rocky Flats plant. And I'm concerned that you close it, some developer like in Candelas is gonna come along, dig up that dirt and release a bunch of airborne plutonium into the atmosphere that the rest of us who live in the area are gonna be breathing. So I would just like you to consider that while you're mm -hmm. deciding what you're gonna do. Sure, thank you. Um, I just have to say that the bar, I, I can't even imagine a situation in which an open space, a dedicated public open space would be developed in that manner. I just, not in our community. I mean, this is a community that prizes open space, obviously. Uh, it says money changes people, but I honestly, honestly can't imagine that happening. I'm looking at Tanya and can you imagine the board? Yeah, so it's protected land. It was purchased for the community, says Tanya Yost, who's a member of Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Board. Uh, okay, wait. I just want to throw out that a lot of people that are at this meeting um, have not lived here that long, and that a lot of people don't even know about Rocky Flats. So you ought to check out Full Body Burden, the book, and read it, because Candelas got developed. Those people can't even plant plants in the ground. So just think about it. Yeah. Just keep it open, whatever you do. Okay, good, good point, thank you. Yes. Um, so my name is Jordan. Um, I live in Westbrook and it takes a lot for me to get up here. I don't like this. But uh, I work at my neighborhood bar, G's Tacos, and I wanna say we get a lot of traffic from the, the off-leash park. Um, and I've worked there for about six years and since the boats have been not allowed in the lake. I've seen a lot of digression in clientele. Um, but we all bond over the dog park. Um, I have a coon hound and when I go out there I notice all of the working dogs out there that are household dogs and every single one of you guys it is so important that like I love seeing them out there running around and this is our bonding time. I, we, I know for sure the rest of you too take your dogs on leashed walks. Um, Okay, and not only that, I wanna say I'm proud of everybody. Mm. So nine, you said, you said nine 250 gallon bags? Uh, yeah. <laughs> we have healthy dogs, you guys. <laughs> 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 oh, ooh, sorry. Um, and okay, and then you noted the trail widening. So back in 2020, you asked us to stay six feet apart, so we did. Okay, yep. <laughs> and we created new paths so we weren't breathing on each other. Yeah. Um, but since then, you guys put up fences, we followed the routes. Um, someone mentioned that we can't read your mind. I, I love that you brought us together for this, um, and I'm really glad to be here because it's one of the few nights that I can attend. Um, I would like to suggest, and maybe we can consider something, and I know you guys, Boulder, blah, 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 but the voice and sight program that they have over there is mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. And if that's something we could implement and that feeds into um, contributing to the ecosystem and whatnot, like, or also with parking too, doing paid parking on the weekends since that's a busy time of year oh, or yeah. week. Mm -hmm. um, but I only go during the weekdays, so I can't speak for, for weekend activity at all. But weekends, if maybe we just have paid parking throughout the weekends or whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I love the dog park. It's very important to my routine and I know so many other people. Um, yeah, okay. My Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for your comments. <laughs> really appreciate it. <laughs> All right, I have to say, go Bills first. <laughs> <laughs> my name is uh, Bill Janowski. I live in Westminster. I lived in Countryside. Previously, I now live in Sunstream. Um, I started using the dog park in 2002. And I want to talk about the biology. I'm a professional biologist with a uh, local federal multi-use agency. And I'm having trouble. Uh, I don't know if folks know, but that used to be grazed by cattle. When I first started going to the dog park, there was nothing there but prairie dogs and cows. There was no vegetation. It was grazed down to the dirt. I would argue now there's more songbirds. There's more wildlife than there ever was previously. So 
I'm having trouble saying that it's directly related to just the dogs going off leash. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder how much nitrogen from urine from cows is in that ground or was in the ground previously. Um, of course, that's where the weeds came from was cattle grazing. Um, it just seems we have the city of uh, Westminster right across the road with Stanley Lake. We have the great park there, preserve all that nature for the birds and the eagles and everything that you're using that. This is for dogs. What about the recent subdivision that was put in? Not only did they expand an existing subdivision, but they built a new senior living community, hundreds of houses that took up all that open space that was over there. Where was the concern for the animals and the biology then? <laughs> so, I don't really have, I, I wanna see data, I wanna see studies, and I can tell you from my agency, mountain bikes have way more trail impacts than hikers, so I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you. As promised. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Becky Campbell. I also live in the countryside area just south of Westview Rec. Uh, and I've been in the area since 2008. And I want to say first off, I love Westminster. I love that this is the engagement of the community. This is the awesome. education of the community that we are all here. I also love that you guys posted the ERO. Um, as Laura had stated before, it is a very interesting long document with some some really good information. If you haven't read it, I fully suggest you do. Please do. Um, I want to kind of pull into what somebody else had asked about what is the goal? Is the goal gonna be over that uh, western area, the Women's Creek? Women's Creek. Yes, yeah. and I'm looking at this report and I'm noticing in the noxious grass areas that actually the highest amount of these noxious weeds and noxious grasses and bare lands that are an issue are in that section. And while we don't want our section to get any worse, is there perhaps before we go through this long timeline of finally presenting it to the city council in June, I would really like to ask now that we have these big wide paths that trucks go on that I see, trash cans in the back, because honest people want to help. The people who will leave it will leave it. I'm sorry, that will happen. It is in the study that um, about 50% of the people that reached the leash area just ignored it. So those people will do that, and that is heartbreaking. But for the rest of us, just make it a little bit easier because it is long, and you're gonna get a lot of people that are like, I'm sure it's okay, or oh, my hands are already full. Make it easier for them. We have the resources, we do it on Big Dry Creek. Mm -hmm. The path is big enough, it's meant for trucks. Um, so I guess what I really wanna ask from you is that is a lovely timeline, nothing set in stone. But in the meantime, how can we as a city be proactive to ever get it from here, even if the recommendation goes through? We should be doing something now. Agreed, thank you very much, great comments. Yeah. <laughs> Next. Hey, uh, my name's Courtney. I think I am maybe the only person in this room that doesn't live in Westminster. Um, I live in Denver, and I feel like it says a lot that I'm up here on a Wednesday night. Uh, I, my question is, do you have to be a resident of Westminster to be part of the board you were talking about? Yes. All right, fair enough. Uh, second question is, I, I mean, I'm here between five and six. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, so just real quick on her question on that. Yeah. Why does it have to be a resident of Westminster? Because you said yourself that city taxes don't go to this. It comes from sales tax, which it I'm comes from sales paying. taxes, which everybody in the state pays for. So I think that's a great point. Um, I do think that this property belongs to the, to the citizens of Westminster. And uh, really, it's up to their elected officials ultimately to decide where this all goes. And I think we owe it to the citizens of Westminster to have the opportunity to guide and, and give input on this decision. That, I, mean, yeah. I, I think that's really what's fair. Um, that is fair, but I have like one more point to that. 
<laughs> I was just gonna say, have you, I mean, I am here between, call it four and six days a week. I come in the morning before work. Wow. I see the woman with the six golden retrievers who's maybe here, the guy <laughs> with the German short hair pointers. Like, I don't pay taxes in Westminster, mm -hmm. true. Uh, but I am here. Well, that's what I was, that's my point is, mm -hmm. have you weighed kind of the economical impact of this? I'm sure you have, uh, but I'm, I'm curious, like I do my grocery shopping here on Saturdays. I go to the breweries. I go to GQ barbecue. I like am spending a majority of time here <laughs> that I, that I'm not going to do anymore. Sure. Uh, and I'm just curious, kind of like, has, has that been weighed into the, into the equation? And I know that the decision hasn't been made. Yeah. Yet. No, it hasn't. But, you know, that's a great point. And I was actually today talking to our economic development director about that very point. And I know from sort of past experience that parks that draw people into your community or parks that are large uh, natural areas have a real positive impact on your local economy. Mm -hmm. So there, there is very much an economic aspect to this decision. You're okay. absolutely right. Yeah. And the, my final point is, um, I was, you know, considering potentially, ideally, hopefully one day buying property here in Westminster that I absolutely will not do if this park doesn't stay. So that's, I don't know if anyone else is in that position, but yeah. that's okay. the, okay. <laughs> kind of leaving it there. Yeah. Sure. Oh, um, if I can give us a time check, we're going to end at 8 o'clock sharp, but um, we'll be around to answer questions if we don't get to you. So go ahead. Hi, my name is Steven. This is uh, my daughter, Sophia. And um, we, I just want to say that this dog park is a really a crown jewel of our community. And it's so wonderful to see all of you here that really care about this, because we all care about this so much. Um, and so I, I, the first thing I, wanted, I just wanted to say, so I think with the parking problem, I've, I mean, I've, of all the times that I've, we go pretty much every day, it really is not an, an entire week thing. Mm -hmm. I see that's that correct. Saturday and Sunday, yeah. like that's it. Like yeah. everything else, there's plenty of parking mm -hmm. in, in all the parking lots. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and correct. so so if we need to do something, it probably just be for the weekends. Um, also, um, yes, for, you know, if, if there is a, a, a use fee, that's great, more trash cans. Um, if there's fines for, if there's a cer certain people out there saying, hey, you're not picking up your, your poop, you know, we can have fines for people. You can make money yeah. off of this, you know? <laughs> you can make money, tons of money. If just having a person out there is getting a few people saying, hey, pick up your poop. Um, but the, the, yeah, the signage, I know we don't wanna bombard our space with signage, but at the same time, like having some sort of signs of saying like, hey, don't go over here, don't go over there, just stick to these things, please give us a chance. Yeah. Give the people a chance to, to follow the rules and signs sure. because you know, that's, that's, that's the thing. Um, the, I, when I'm there, most people, they're, they're pretty good about things. They stay on the trail. Most dogs stay on, on the trail. So, um, but yeah, I just, and I'm, I'm, one of my questions is that if, is there a plan, even for the future, because I think also for, you know, our kids and everything, like 20 years, 30 years, 50 years from now, is there also, just to offset the demand, because this is such a, a prized place for us, is there, is there a, a, a plan to open other spaces like this so that we don't have to just focus you know, on the environmental impact of just this space, but if we have more dog parks like this, yeah. is there a plan to, yeah. to, so, to uh, offset all of those people because it's such a beloved place? Yeah, that's such a great question. And so right now, uh, kind of on a different track, the Parks Rec and, and Libraries is doing a vision plan for the next 20 to, I guess, 10 to 20 year time frame. And uh, we just got in the results from a statistically accurate uh, survey uh, which what we're trying to do is really determine what do we have, what does the community want, what's the gap, and then come up with a plan to fill the gap. And it, to me, it's very clear that there's a need for additional dog parks throughout the community. Yeah. Uh, neighborhood ones where you can walk from your home to the dog park. You don't have to put them in the Subaru and take them out to Westminster Hills. So yeah, you're right. We do need more. And uh, we're actually starting to look at opportunities around 
We're rebuilding, uh, putting in new irrigation in a lot of our parks right now, and it's an opportunity to kind of rethink. Um, and so we're looking for where it makes sense. There's a new uh, renovation to Squires Park that's starting this summer, and that includes a dog park. And, and there'll be others as we redo parks and it makes sense to the community and we get that feedback from the neighborhood. So thank you. Okay, Sophia, you have something yeah, to say? Yeah, Sophia has something. What do you want to say? I think, I think dogs should be off leash so they can have more exercise and they can have fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. From the children of Westminster, the future. Very nice, thank you. All right, you're next. Hi, um, my name's Tom Thorpe. I live in Westminster. I can walk from my house, to, uh, it's a mile. So sometimes I come combine you know, walking on leash to get to the dog park with the uh, experience of being off leash. Um, just a note, I was trying to use the QR code and it wasn't working on my phone. Has anyone else had Has any problems? Has anyone else had luck with it? It works on the form, people are saying. It works on what, I'm sorry? On, on the piece of paper. The, it's in the lower left hand corner of the handout. Oh, that one seems to be working. It's distorted on the screen. On the okay. Screen. Yeah. Okay. So use the paper. It's also as, on the doorway on your way out. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, I really mm -hmm. like the way that it started out where you were listing the, the needs of uh, and all of the concerns. And I think if we were to concentrate on that at this moment, even though you've pre presented solutions that have been recommended, that if we can all think of everything in terms of needs, then solutions will naturally present themselves and um, to hold off on those solutions that we've seen right now. So I've seen um, needs around you know, the land itself, the needs around the wildlife that are on, on the land, uh, visitors' needs. And so when I look at that and, and you know, that there, we want healthy land so that we have a good aesthetic for being able to provide that recreational experience for us. Um, we want a healthy environment for the, the wildlife. Uh, and a, another need for me is safety. I like to know that you know, animal conflicts between my dogs and other dogs will be minimized. Um, safety it, um, comes up for me around um, COVID and social distancing. When COVID-19 broke out, I saw that one main trail. It just really widened. So I was surprised when I saw the social trails being cut down because from a safety point of view, that said to me that we're gonna be concentrating more on the other trails. So I had a, a safety concern around that. And from a, a, a personal need to be able to recreate and be in nature and uh, relieve the stress and just you know have a spiritual connection that I don't have uh, in the rest of the world and my dogs the joy that they have when they're they're out being able to run free and live like dogs want to live so again you know I think if we think about needs we'll be able to work things out in in uh, unique creative um, solutions and I appreciate your your time thank you Wow Tom thank you very much we really appreciate it thank you hi my name is Andy Palaszewski I live adjacent to the dog park I just had my dog out there for a three-mile run I'm trying to rehab my hip from a little bit of a skiing injury and uh, I appreciate Tom's comments and the Guardians comments are fantastic I love the ideas they have um, gentlemen, I appreciate you for being here and braving this somewhat <laughs> feisty crowd, let's say, <laughs> and the mayor and as well as city council here as well. It's great to have a forum like this. I think that the Guardians brought up a great idea, slowing things down. Mm. Slowing things down, Tom's comments about needs analysis versus jumping to some conclusion, living adjacent to the dog park. I can envision 33 acres if that was the plan going forward, which thank God it's not today, it's just one option. That would become a mud pit right next to our homes. And then you're going to have the bubonic plague ridden prairie dogs taking over. If anybody has biked the trail, right, the Dry Creek Trail, prairie dogs all along. Stanley Lake, prairie dogs all around. 
I mean, we can't go in the area where the eagles are because the eagles are there. You know, we can't, I don't even know if we can build a trail through that yet uh, for bikes because I've biked that before and, and it, it is really dangerous. So the path that's there on the south side is a great start. However, I don't want to see, you know, the prairie dogs take off, take off and take over more land and the dogs not get to use that as much. And I love the little girl's comment. She had a beautiful little picture, too. I really wanted her to show it. Yeah. Sophia. Um, so, yeah. Dogs or prairie dogs? Bubonic plague or poop? And I think that, I think enforcement, you know, let's look at the issues of, of law enforcement. I think enforcement is really the answer of the current requirements within Westminster, not more rules. Making more rules and not enforcing the ones you have basically lead to massive legislation in Washington, D.C. God help us. <laughs> Name is Greg Carberry, West Dog Park Guardians. Uh, I live in Arvada and the dog park. Um, I want to address real quick the community action team. Yeah. We started talking on it. Uh, gentleman asked me, how's it going to be picked? And along with what I was saying earlier, Westminster statement, their vision and uh, mission statement talks about community and diversity. <clears throat> the diversity that comes into that dog park is from all over. So I think, you know, good ideas are gonna come from outside of just residents of Westminster. Mm -hmm. As far as how's that gonna be picked? So uh, two questions there, one comment question um, one question just and a, a statement comment. if I could address the statement first which is um, there's a lot of opportunity for engagement and giving us advice um, throughout this whole process so we opened up another survey tonight and yes it has some questions and we want you to weigh things but there's also most importantly opportunities for you to give us comments and give us your ideas. And I've heard so many great ideas tonight. We want to be sure that we capture all those and then share them with the community advisory team. We're going to work on, uh, we've asked for applications. Um, in the application, you'll see that people can tell us a little bit about themselves and kind of what their perspective is. Because we want to have a balanced perspective. We definitely want to have people who are passionate about their dogs and that live in countryside or that uh, want to really prize bicycling, like cycling through there, or really prize native birds and fauna and so on. So it's got to be a balanced, it has to be balanced, right? So we'll be looking at that. We had a great, got a great group tonight for sure, so thank you. Okay, and then uh, I really wasn't planning on speaking tonight, but mm -hmm. I wanted to say that I looked through the report and there's a lot of statements in there, but as far as the impact of the dogs, I mean, the E. coli, okay, so it's high. It comes in and it exits at the same level. That's not dog impact there. The reservoir, that's on leash. That's not dog packed in, uh, impact over there. This is a matter of personal choice, personal freedoms there. My dog, you know, you wanna tell me how bad it is, show me some studies of people and the dogs getting sick. And then, you know, let's consider it. But Dogs are gross. I mean, E. coli is second nature to them. And then with the rest of this report, I mean, it's a great report. We've got, uh, you know, invasive weeds that have higher percentage over in the on-leash area. What about the surrounding areas? Where are the baselines from the surrounding areas? I've been out there, and the wind is constantly blowing out there. Seeds and all that crap is going to blow over into our area. And then on top of my last point, 3,000? Square acres of open space in Westminster? 3,800 and... Hey! Yeah, something like that. We're talking about 400 acres mm -hmm. out of all that area, and you have to singularly focus on that. Concentrate on that other area, keeping that open space, and then our 400 acres of off-leash area, properly manage that so that people will get on that app and go, that's the greatest dog park around. It's off-leash, and my dog, being big or chihuahua, can run their butts off. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Alvin. Uh, I live right across the street from the entrance of the dog park. And parking's been an issue for quite a, quite a few years. And me and Joe's been talking about it. 
We've done numerous things. Um, it's not so bad in the back of the neighborhood. And to be honest, through the week, it's not bad at all through the week. But on the weekends, our front of our house is a Walmart parking lot. There's hundreds of cars, literally, 50 to 100, if it's a busy weekend, come home from work, know where to park in front of our house. It's, it's just desecrating our neighborhood in the entrance area where I lived for 25 years. When I moved in, that was open space, and we thought we had a country setting. And we love animals. I love dogs. I've had them my whole life. But our entrance to 105th and Route Lane, right across from the dog park, um, people just park in there, and it's, it's legal to do it. I mean, I can't say anything, but a lot of people are from Longmont, Aurora, out of Westminster. And like I said, it's a free country. You can park wherever you want, but we need to get some signs, Joe. We need to put something there on the weekends. We're at least in the first, that's a, it's actually a safety issue. People are flying through our neighborhood. We got my neighbor on the other corner and a lot of my neighbors are here right now, but we love animals. It's just the, par the parking is way out of hand. There's just too much traffic and we don't have a weekend at our house anymore. And it is that bad. If anybody wants to come on a weekend, come right on the corner of 105th in Sims, you'll see what I'm talking about. And we gotta get this addressed. Thank you. It's been years since I've been talking about this. Years. Yeah. So right. thank you very much thank for you. coming. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Hello, hello, my name's Robbie. I live in Westbrook. Um, one thing that I haven't heard talked about is the Rocky Mountain bike path that's going to go through there and actually going to be close to completed in the next year or two. Uh, you're going to have a lot of gravel bikers, more than you have now. You're going to have a lot of mountain bikers going through there. Is everybody going to get along? Mm -hmm. Yeah, point. and I, yeah. when you say no and you're looking, I've ridden through there and I've had dogs that are off leash chase me. And I've given the person that has that dog plenty of space and I'm riding as fast as my old bones can go and the dog's right near me. Who is gonna pay, who's gonna help me if that dog bites me? Some of these people, and I'm not saying anybody here, are not responsible when other people are going by, bikers, and there's gonna be more of them. I mean, it's, it's a spot. So, I mean, it needs to be addressed because there's, there's room in there. I've had people say, oh, you're not supposed to be in here. Huh. Yeah, well, guess what? Yeah. There's a pump right at the start of the trail. So what are you going to do? So that's my question. Thank so. you. That's a great point. Um, boy, we've got just a couple minutes left. So if we could wrap it up real quick between I'll, the two of you. I'll try to be I'm, fast. We'll be up here if you have any other questions and want to come up and ask us. Okay, so I've been a Westminster resident since 1999. In 2002, I started circling the neighborhoods trying to find a place to live next to the dog park. I don't have human kids. My dogs are my kids. I shop for dog parks, not school districts. So with that being said, I moved into that dog park when it was a dust bowl, when a lot of those trails were actually present. They just weren't as wide. It's actually more beautiful than it was when I moved in there. It is one of the only places people can run and bike with their dogs. I've had three coon hounds and a Dalmatian. So my dogs are high energy dogs that will not get exercise in my yard or on a leash. Um, I am a mental health therapist. I specialize in trauma. One of the things that hasn't been brought up are the mental health benefits of community, which we do get out there in the park. Um, <laughs> Also diversity, we have people from all socioeconomic standards. So when people are talking about parking passes, while that wouldn't impact me because I'm a couple doors down, I do think of the people that go and use that park that don't have the financial means to do that if there were those passes. Um, volunteer days built a lot of community. I don't know where those went, but you know, picking up and getting that golden poop award was actually kind of funny. My neighbor who's over there has a golden poop award in her house. Um, I think we then, need to reinitiate that right away. <laughs> the, the golden then, poop award. <laughs> then the other thing is we've been looking at this as a problem mm -hmm. rather than an opportunity. We have a very unique model park here that can be used that you mentioned, you know, the apps that say this is wonderful. Let's use this as an opportunity to say, hey, Westminster has this amazing park. 
Let, let's use this as a model, help other cities create a park like this, and then you guys will be looked at as, oh my gosh, you were the leaders in creating other dog parks, and it would cut down. But yeah. this park being as big as it is, is what the draw is. Yeah, Thank agreed. you. Thank you so much. All right, for those, for those of you that are waiting in line, I'm really sorry. We're gonna end after this gentleman's comments, but we will be up here to answer any questions. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Caleb. I actually don't know where the trails are. This is the first time I've seen a trail map and I've been going there for three years. So I would love to see a trail map at the beginning, posts and signs telling us this is actually the trail. Yeah. Um, someone mentioned the Boulder Voice and Sight program. That's, well, that's a really good idea. It's actually a pretty steep requirement your dog is not supposed to approach other humans, not supposed to approach other dogs until you both consent. That's a pretty high bar. Mm -hmm. And that's why I come down to Westminster instead of going up to the Boulder open spaces. Mm -hmm. Reduced size in dog parks actually leads to a lot more dog aggression mm -hmm. because the ways dog regulates is moving away from each other. Right. Yeah. 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 So my last point is human traffic. So will anyone here, if the changes go through, we get a smaller dog park, will anyone go the exact same amount? Will anyone stop going at all? So the major changes we'd see would be reduced human use. And I don't think that's something we should go for. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everybody. I just thank you so much. I really want to compliment everyone for taking an evening to come and, and share with you, us your ideas, your thoughts, your criticisms. It's greatly appreciated. This is really, for me, the best of local government is a community that's this engaged and cares this much. So thank you very much. Please fill out the survey. Please apply to be on the on the uh, advisory committee if that's of interest to you. And thank you for coming, we really appreciate it.